Okay, so today we're going to talk about a second-order linear system. Now, we've talked about these before, and they are of the form x double prime is equal to um, kx. But now we're going to add an, an additional feature. We're going to say with forcing. Okay, let's talk about this. So what we're going to do is then add a vector forcing now of t. Now again, this is linear, but it has a, uh, a forcing function that is doesn't include any value of x over there. So let's, uh, so let's <coughs> talk about a specific example. Now in the previous videos, I've done our two-story uh, building, U-I-L-D-I-N-G. Okay, and I want to do that again, but now we're going to uh, have an earthquake. All right, so let's let's recall our building again. So we have a two-story building with a mass two on top and a spring connected to uh, the ground floor, which we'll call mass one, and that is then connected to another spring that's connected to the ground. And we like to think of these as being kind of on wheels. And here we have this is sort of on its own little track with its own set of wheels. And uh, the, the building stories can then rotate back and forth or rock back and forth with respect to each other. But now an earthquake uh, implies that the ground starts shaking. So there's an F of T shaking the ground. So what we're going to do now is say that this is now forcing against this building some force, um, f of t, and we're going to write it like as follows. Um, so we're going to say our f of t now, as the vector, is only going to force the ground floor, so it'll be 1 times 0, and it's going to be some periodic forcing, so I'll say cosine omega t. Okay, so let's write down our system again. Let's talk about, and I'm going to keep the numbers simple here. We'll take mass 1 is going to be equal to 1, and mass 2 is going to be equal to 1 as well. And I'm not going to have any damping. Okay, and then we're going to have, um, uh, and that can, we can create a nice second order linear system with that. And then finally what we're going to do is we're going to take our K1, the spring down here, K1 will be 3, so it's going to be a stiff spring, and we're going to say that K2 is going to be 2, so slightly softer spring on the top floor. Okay, so with these equations, we know that um, the, the, the problem is going to look like this. X double prime is going to be equal to the position of the top floor. And the, or sorry, the uh, position of the bottom floor and the position of the top floor. And that'll be the second time derivative. And that's going to be equal to this stiffness matrix, which is negative k1 plus k2, 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 negative k2, all right, times x1, x2, plus our forcing, 1, 0, cosine omega t. Okay, good. So uh, let's write down, let's figure out how to solve this thing. So before we do anything, we always, uh, um, I'm gonna, we always want to solve for the uh, homogeneous solution first, right? And we're going to not worry about the, the forcing at first. So let's write down our stiffness matrix. So this implies that the stiffness matrix, if we plug in the values here, it's going to be 3 and 2, that becomes a negative 5. 2, 2, and negative 2. Okay, so let's solve this thing. So I'll write down my stiffness matrix again. Negative 5, 2, 2, negative 2. And now we need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So we do this by solving the standard characteristic equation. So we have negative 5 minus lambda. Uh, 2, 2, negative 2 minus lambda. And we're going to take the determinant of it, and that becomes uh, lambda plus 5, lambda plus 2, minus 4 equals 0. Uh, let's multiply this out. 
lambda squared plus seven lambda. Uh, five times ten is or five times two is ten minus four is a uh, plus six is equal to zero. This factors very nicely. Lambda minus six and a lambda, uh, sorry, minus one. Okay, so I'm going to say that lambda one is equal to one, and lambda two is equal, to, sorry, lambda one is equal to negative one, and lambda two is equal to negative six. Now, uh, recall then for second order systems of the form, of this form, that the lambdas are equal to the negative natural frequency, the square, the negative square of the natural frequency. So that means our natural frequencies are lambda one is equal to one radian per second, and lambda two is equal to square root of six. Okay. So square root of 6 is approximately 2.45, and we're going to be revisiting these frequencies. All right, so um, <coughs> the solutions, the, the, the complementary solution, i.e. the homogeneous solution, we'll call it xc, is always going to be uh, v1, the eigenvector associated with the intrinsic frequency, times a1 cosine t, because we're talking about omega 1, plus b1 sine t, plus v2 a2 cosine root 6 t, plus b2 sine sine root 6 t. All right, so we can look that up in the book. And so we'll have to find these eigen uh, vectors here. So it turns out um, I can solve for them. This is going to be 1, 2, and this is actually uh, 2, negative 1. All right, so, um, but I'm not really interested in this complementary solution. So this is, so what we're going to do is actually uh, talk about our initial condition. So I'm not interested in having any vibration existing in the system before we force it. So I'm actually going to say that the uh, that the initial condition of the system is going to be 0, 0. And the initial velocity of the system is also going to be 0, 0. So there's no energy in the system. And that implies that A1, 2 is equal to 0. And that B1 and B2 are also equal to 0. So that means I don't have to worry about the complementary solution at all. What I want to find then is the particular solution of t uh, that's going to that solves the non homogeneous problem so let's write down what that problem is again I'm gonna go get a new sheet here okay All right so my new uh, so my equation then remember is x double prime is equal to the stiffness matrix times x plus this forcing term, which I'll write down again, cosine omega t. Okay, so um, so I'm going to assume that omega is not equal to uh, um, our intrinsic frequencies. We don't want to worry about those resonance points that where uh, the solution is not going to exist. It will imply an infinite amplitude. Okay, so we're going to assume that our forcing is not equal to any of our intrinsic frequencies. But um, what we do want to do then is we want to find xp of t. So uh, as usual, we're going to uh, xp of t by uh, we're going to try a little arrow there, try a solution of the form C, some vector, times cosine omega t. Alright, so uh, we want it to solve this DE up there, so what we're going to do is plug it in and try to solve for this unknown. So this is unknown. Okay, so um, x 
xp double prime is going to be equal to c, in this case it's a vector, but this is a constant vector, it's going to be equal to negative omega squared cosine omega t equals, and so that's the, that's the left hand side there, so we put our equal sign here, and then we multiply k, right, times c times cosine omega t, so we just plug in our x there, and then plus 1, 0, cosine omega t. All right. So uh, we see that there's a, this has to be true for all values of t, and so there's a common factor of cosine in each one that cancels. And now again, remember, c is the unknown, so we want to solve for that unknown. So we're going to do a little uh, uh, moving things across the equal sign. We're going to get a... Um, so I want to uh, subtract this, and I want to add that. So we're going to get uh, negative 1, 0 is equal to, uh, we see here is a k uh, plus omega squared times, we'll put that i, the identity matrix, times c. So this is a linear system we can solve. So let's look at what k minus omega squared i is. It's going to be, well, what was it? So it was minus 5. Uh, sorry, this is a plus omega squared, plus omega squared, 2, 2, minus 2, plus omega squared. All right? And so we want to solve this for some c's equal to negative 1, 0. All right, so let's pause to remember what we're doing here, finding this particular solution. This is a particular solution. It's all we're interested in. And the c1 and c2 are the amplitudes of oscillation of the floors of our, of our stories. All right, so they're important numbers. We want to force this, uh, this two-story building by shaking it with an earthquake. And these values here then give us how strong, uh, given that forcing, how, how much deflection do each four have? How much bending is there in the building? So, of course, if these are very large numbers, we can say that, uh, that uh, well, something about this, the forcing frequency that we, we drove it with is uh, it, uh, caused a really huge uh, shaking in the building, and that could be very bad. Uh, we could have uh, parts of the building getting broken. There's a lot of stress on the building, and obviously that's not healthy. So we want to investigate what happens to this building as we're shaking it, and we want to do it for all sorts of frequencies, all right? Except for, of course, the, the resonant frequencies, which we know are a problem. Okay, so let's talk about that. So we can solve this equation. Um, so here what I'll do is I'll start with the bottom row here. So we have um, 2C1 minus, uh, so uh, well actually I'll go plus, so uh, um, omega squared minus 2 times C2 equals 0. So that means that C1 is going to be equal to omega squared minus 2 uh, minus all over 2 times C2. Okay, so wherever I see a C1, I can put this in its place. Now I'm going to go to the top row. So we have um, omega squared minus 5 times C1 right here. So C1, of course, is going to be uh, minus omega squared minus 2 all over 2. And then we add to it plus, so that's there's a C2 there and then plus 2c2, and that's going to be equal to negative 1. So then we have to solve for c2 here, and that is um, uh, c2, we factor it out, and we get, um, I'll put it all over 2, we have a uh, negative omega squared minus 5, omega squared minus 2 plus 4 and that's equal to negative 1 so C2 is going to be equal to um, 
2 uh, omega squared minus 5 omega squared minus 2 minus 4 and I'm going to foil out this denominator here so that becomes omega to the fourth power minus 7, seven oops sorry minus 7 omega to the second power right and then we have a, a, a negative 5 and a negative 2 that makes a positive 10 minus 4 that makes a plus um, a plus uh, 6 All right we can keep factoring that factoring it in terms of omega squared and that of course this right here is the characteristic equation or at least a, a, a version of it so that becomes omega squared uh, minus 6 and an omega squared minus 1. Of course when omega is equal to uh, root 6 or 1 we have a division by 0 which was of course the uh, the resonant uh, frequencies that we were already aware of. Finally uh, we'll write down C1 um, that's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, we just have to multiply C2 by this this uh, factor here and we'll get C1 so that becomes negative omega squared minus 2 all over omega squared minus 6 and omega squared minus 1. Alright so we have these this is our result those are our amplitudes now we like to study this a little bit more in detail so let's uh, bring up a new sheet and let's write down those uh, C1 and C2 again. C1 again was uh, minus omega squared minus 2 all over omega squared minus 6 and omega squared minus 1 and C2 was uh, 2 over omega squared minus 6 and omega squared minus 1. Okay. Alright, so let's talk about these in terms of the uh, of all the possible frequencies. So we have here an axis of omega, right? So this is our forcing frequency. Actually, I'm going to draw that a little bit smaller here. Right, we'll draw it out there. There's our omega, and there is zero. So um, if we force it at zero, what happens to these two things? So let's look at uh, C2, it looks a little simpler. If I C2 at the zero frequency, you can think of this as a function of omega. It's going to be 2 minus, uh, or 2 over 6, which is 1 third. So omega zero, that, that corresponds to, of course, not an oscillating frequency at all, but actually a constant forcing. So we'll say that's uh, 1 third right there. All right, and then, um, so, that, so this is what I'll call, uh, this will be my C2. Right, this is the top floor of the building. Okay, we want to know what amplitude is this oscillating at. And now at this really low frequency, if we put anything for frequencies that are very low that are below one, so I'm going to put one on there. One is right here, and then two is right there, and then uh, we'll say three is right there. We knew at that root six. Remember, omega one was one, and omega two was root 6 or about 2.45 so right about there I'm gonna I'm gonna call that omega 2 that are our first resonant frequency and omega 1 that's right there so this 2.5 then we know there's gonna be a division by 0 there so I'm gonna do that and do that we know there's gonna be vertical asymptotes at those two points all right, and we want to know what happens to the amplitude of the second floor as I sweep through all these frequencies, accepting the resonant frequencies. So we want to know, is C2 positive or negative? Um, and um, if, if this is below 1 and below 6, this will be a negative number and this will be a negative number, but the negative and negative cancel makes it positive. But we know we're heading towards a division by 0, so it has to go up like this. And it'll the freak the, the 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 amplitude will get larger and larger and larger. Likewise, when we skip above one, all of a sudden we know this will become a positive number, and this will still be a negative number. So it's going to go down like this. It'll start up like this. 
So that's a... All right, and then finally, um, this will keep being negative, but it'll get smaller and smaller, and I, I contend it does something like this. And then finally, it goes... Once you get above 6, this is a positive number, and that's a positive number, and it goes down like that. So I'm going to call that C2, and I'll give that a little, a little dark shading to it. So again, this is the top floor of the building, and this is the amplitude. So we knew the resonant frequencies were a problem. And so, but we see now uh, kind of where, where, where the system is. Now let's look at C2, or C1. Right, so we have this additional thing up here. So notice that at omega equals square root of 2, C1 is actually equal to 0. So again, we're forcing this thing at a frequency of, and that's about 1.41, right? So that'll be about right there. So we'll call that root 2. So this is an interesting point. At that point, I'm forcing the building at a particular frequency. I'm forcing the bottom floor at a certain frequency, but the amplitude is zero. But we know at that point, the top floor is actually shaking back and forth quite a bit. It has an amplitude of, well, something non-zero. So um, let's go through the same process again. At, 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 um, if I put zero in here into C1, you'll see that, um, so C1, at zero is going to be equal to, again, one-third. And you can just plug that in and see it. So it goes like this. Uh, but then uh, it also will start rising up. Um, and so we'd like to get an idea of the magnitude. And I've actually plotted the graph. Uh, so we see that um, I'm just going to check that again. So actually, the amplitude is a little bit lower. And it goes like that. So that's C1, and that's C2. Um, but here, what we find is that, remember, it crosses the zero point right there. This is C1, and that's C2. And then it continues up right here. And then finally, it goes back down like that. And if you just check the signs of this thing, when it switches signs, you can see that that has to be true. So um, here you see that the difference between, there is a difference in amplitude, but they're both pointing the same direction here for this bottom frequency. So for low frequencies near here, now the amplitude might be big or it might be small, but they're both, both uh, top floor and bottom floor are gonna be swaying uh, together. So for all of this right here, uh, uh, the two floors sway together. But, starting right about there, they start diverging. This, so, uh, sorry, I should say right about there. All of a sudden here, the, the bottom floor is, is going one direction, and, and, the, and the top floor now is actually going, is going to be swaying in the opposite direction. So again, for, for low frequencies, for omega less than square root of 2, the floors do this. So, so the floor will be here, there'll be another floor there, and they both move together, right? They might have slightly different amplitudes, but they're both going to move together, right? For now, for omega greater than square root of 2, what you're going to get is when, one, when the top floor is going to the left or to the right, the bottom floor will be going to the left. And so the, the, the amplitude between the two buildings is going to be really large, even though the amplitude of one building in one story in isolation is going to be uh, whatever it is, but if we consider the relative amplitude between the two stories, it's going to be larger and larger and larger. So of course this is a more dangerous place to be because you're actually going to be you know, stretching your building, this, or you're stretching your floors this way and this way, right? They're both going opposite directions. So the net stretch between the buildings is big. Okay, so that's a more dangerous point. So what we know is, um, 
for 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 forcing frequencies uh, near uh, two point four five are more dangerous. Of for tearing <laughs> tearing the building in half. Part. Okay. So there's there's our, our big result. We can analyze this system. We can see that the amplitudes for higher frequencies have this. Even if the amplitude's low, it's still you're going to get doubly as much. And so again, I've hand drawn it here, but I can also um, uh, draw the same. I drew the same thing in MATLAB to get an idea for the relative sizes of these things. So. Blue in this case is the uh, is C1, and green in this case is C2, and we can see the same behavior, um, and uh, the amplitudes get get large in the in the in the right places. But we see there's this this uh, this disparity at at values near square root of, at forcing values forcing frequencies near square root of six, so the amplitudes go in the opposite direction. So that pretty much concludes what we're going to talk about today. I hope this helps you sort out how to solve non-homogeneous systems and how to study uh, what is going on with them and, 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 uh, and see how you can gain some insights into the behaviors of, of, these, of these structures. All right, thank you.